Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome. So welcome. Well, it's, a, well, it's such a nice crowd here this morning. We really appreciate coming out here, Jimmy. Our speaker today is Jimmy Blake of uh, Blessington in uh, County Wicklow in Ireland. He is owner of the five-acre Hunting Brook Gardens that is surrounded by 15 acres of woodland, uh, valleys, and streams. The gardens and woodlands are filled with various plants that uh, Jimmy has collected in his travels around the world. Uh, Jimmy trained at the National Botanic Gardens in Dublin and as a young horticulturist worked first for 12 years at the Airfield House in Dundrum, which was an old Victorian house that was revived and the gardens were uh, brought back to their earlier state and opened to the public once again. So after working there for 12 years, he then moved to his family property and opened a garden there which he's called Huntingbrook Gardens. He's a close friend and mentor of Helen, uh, uh, Helen, Dent Helen Dillon, uh, Helen Dillon is his mentor, I should say, over around. In a recent profile in the London Telegraph, uh, they wrote about Jimmy as being one of the new plant gurus of our time. He's here today on a series of lectures which began in Boston all the way down from Washington to North Carolina. He's here today to talk about his garden and some of the new plants that he has found in European nurseries and how he uses them in the garden. So please welcome Jimmy Blake. Microphone, see if it's on. Should be good. Got the green light, Jimmy? Yeah. Okay, we're ready. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful morning. Um, okay. I'm going to tell you a bit about hunting book first, where it is, okay? Um, I need a little... This is hunting book here. So, it's about 40 minutes inland from Dublin city centre, into the hills, into the Wicklow Hills, near a place called Blessington. And this is the, this is the farm I grew up on here, and this is my spot, this is hunting book. Um, so this is day one, uh, after, well, you, you heard I trained in Botanic Gardens and worked in Dublin for 12 years, and then got fed up with that, I, need, I wanted to be my own boss, and uh, luckily I got 20 acres on the side of the farm. It's about a thousand feet, so it's, it's high up, so it's, it's, it's cold for Ireland. Um, temperature wise, Fahrenheit. We had minus 15 a few years ago, Celsius a few years ago. Is that That's very cold. That's the <laughs> reason I can never remember what it is in Fahrenheit. But that was that was exceptional. Usually we get kind of minus minus five, minus eight, and probably similar uh, temperature in winter to here maybe. Uh, this is see these widgets here. These are probably about 150 years old where potatoes were grown. So this field ne had no, no, you couldn't get a tractor into it. So it was, it was really lovely soil to use. Uh, it's acid soil, and you're looking over the Wicklow Mountains there, which divide the county. This is day two. <laughs> she in, uh, making the, the entrance into the place. And it's called Hunting Brook because we found an 1836 map with the name Hundybrook on the stream. So at the very end of the talk, I'm going to go through other parts of the garden, and that's why we call it Hundybrook. Uh, this is day three. <laughs> uh, the house arrived in from Poland, and timber house. Timber houses are quite unusual in Ireland. Um, for some reason, our planning people don't seem to like timber houses. They don't fit in. It's a lot of rubbish. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk quite a bit about this border today. Oh, oh. <coughs> no, 
country soil. And that's the border then a few years later. And I work a lot with light, and the more, the more I garden, the more I really appreciate light coming through plants. So we really look at plants as well today that look well with light coming through them, morning light, evening light. Um, and certainly we need a lot more light than, you get a lot of light here. We don't get enough light. So we need as much as we can get. Was that sunrise or sunset? That's sunrise. Right. Yeah, yeah. This that one is this summer actually. Yeah. A lovely sunrise. So I'm going to look at a whole mixture of perennials today. What I've been doing I, for years, I've been collecting rare and unusual plants. I still do, but what I'm really interested in is long flowering perennials. And what I've done over the last 10 years is I'm continually buying buying plants. Um, I trial them in the garden. I don't have trial beds, but they're, they're dotted around through the garden. It's not very obvious to the public, but I'm watching them to see how good they are over, over a few years. If they're not performing well, I get rid of them. <coughs> and, you know, we're going to look at a group of Sangasorbus today. Um, I might have grown 20 different Sangasorbus. So I, I wanted to get that down to maybe three. Three really good ones that perform really well for me. So we're going to look at that sort of sort of thing today. Uh, in the last few weeks while I've been here, I've been looking at some really lovely gravel gardens and that area in Chanteterre. I spent a bit of time in Chanteterre a few years ago working and I'm back to it the other day. And I think I'm going to do something here to get rid of this gravel. And yeah, it's really kind of a secret. Um, this is obviously a car park, and I'm getting ready to change it into a garden. And we're going to look a lot at this area. So that's kind of looking through, through that area. And um, my passion is, is change, changing the garden. If I, if, if I might be growing really good plants for years, but if I get bored of them, I get rid of them. There's no point getting bored. There's so many plants out there to grow. There's more plants every year. Um, moment I'm going through salvia phase <laughs> and too many tender plants phase. <laughs> so this is just looking down on the garden. Okay, so we're, we're just onto your plant list now. I know it's probably kind of hard to see it, but you're at number one there. Now I know you don't have the same growing conditions as me, okay? There's plants you're going to look at here and you're going to say, well, should they burn up during the summer? Um, with us, they don't. <laughs> and it's very hard for me to know exactly what kind of plants actually perform really well for a long time. For us, these sort of geraniums flower from um, June until winter. Um, a big thing I do in my garden is I do a lot of cutting back. So if plants during the summer don't look well, this is, this is what you, you do a lot of, is cut them to the ground. If geraniums have burnt up in the, in, the, in the heat, cut them back. Give them a water, give them a feed, give them compost around them to encourage them to come back up again. I do that a lot. I do not let the garden... I, I keep the garden looking fresh as much as I can. I know that's a harder job probably for me with, with the heat. But this geranium is from a nursery in Dublin. It's our best herbaceous nursery called Mount Venus. So if you're ever over, it's one worth visiting. Oh, it is tough when you go to nurseries and you can't bring back the plants. <laughs> Try and go to that one. Um, and please, they found this geranium in their, in their garden. It's a huge, big flower. Um, it's sterile, so it flowers for a long time. Um, it's, uh, I use it for edging some of the beds. You see it here? Um, I like to choose a lot of those main borders. I like to choose one plant for edging, and that plant has to perform for a long time. It has to look good for a long time. So it frames the painting, and you get away with murder then in behind it. <laughs> you, know, you can have lots of different things, but if you frame the painting, it's, it's, it's great. And that does well for me. Um, and then, you know, if this doesn't, is this not going to work for you, maybe start thinking, what can I edge a bed that's got very dotty? You know, it, all ha it happens to us all. What can I use instead of this? In your, in, or what can you use in your garden instead of that tree? Have a think about that. 
Um, nice grass there. It, it's, it's probably my favourite grass, Chinatoa rubra. I don't know what's down here. Can you, can you grow that? <coughs> Chinatoa rubra. It's an amazing grass. It's my favourite grass. It's, it's big. It goes up to about four foot. It's evergreen. It's from New Zealand. Um, it's got a kind of a kind of an orangey pink in it as well as brown. It's not just that brown dead grass, but it's a lovely grass. Uh, my favourite terrain, the longest flowering geranium at home is Anne Thompson. It's not Anne Folk, Anne Folk are just frawly, Anne Thompson's just got that lovely shape. And this is my favourite plant for edging the main border. It's, uh, it's sterile as well, so with us it flowers from the end of May through to winter. You can see it edging there. Um, I think I've been thinking about since I came over as well when people are saying to me when geraniums don't they burn up during the summer is think about what annuals you can add in through that through that edging so that when the geranium kind of burns up a bit that you have annuals coming along and there I added in hundreds of calendula Indian prints <coughs> which is a beautiful calendula. And I had just come back from Rajasthan. I was so into colour, but I'm still so into colour. But just, I was so inspired by the way they use those sort of colours. So that was Indian print, calendula Indian prints planted in uh, May through the geranium. A uh, great geranium, um, really good nurseryman in the south of England called Green Goff, Merchant's Hardy Plants. He's a really, he's an amazing amazing nursery man. He found this geranium in a village nearby, his nursery. It's very large, it flowers in, it's those early flowering geraniums. So in May, May June time. Um, and it's got that lovely light blue with red veins going through it. Uh, it's a beauty. And then I cut them back and then they, they send up the odd flower during the summer. Well worth, I mean it's probably not, it's not available yet, but um, have patience, it'll be here soon. Uh, I think this is wonderful. And I think it, it excites me much more than Roseanne. Uh, I, it's, it's really long flowering with us. I keep saying with us, because I get in trouble. People keep giving out to me at talks. Uh, Havana Blue. Um, it was in that trial in Wisley uh, of geraniums, and it got an, it got an award at Garden Merit. Um, and it's worth looking up their trials. You can look up Wisley or HS. Wisley trials online, and you'll get the report on those trials. It's th I, I go over a lot to Wisley to follow them and, and see what's happening. But that is a real winner, and that's one now I'm thinking of. If I'm getting bored of a beautiful geranium along the front, maybe I'll start, maybe I'll use this in the next few years. And the bees like it as well. Geranium Sue Krug. I'm lucky to have Krug nurseries across the water in, in Wales. Um, I've bought millions of plants there over the years. <laughs> Killed millions of plants over the years. Um, Sue is uh, one of the owners of, of, of Krug. And this geranium is one of those weavers. I like geraniums that weave in true and create these beautiful combinations. Uh, but they don't pull down the other plants. So they're just softly going through. And, and Sue Krug is one of them. And there it is with Salvi when swish and uh, canna, top canna. Uh, so that's worth sussing out. Uh, Crystal Lake is another one of those weaving geraniums. I saw this in Dove Cottage. It's a garden and nursery up in Halifax in uh, Yorkshire. An amazing small garden. I think it's one of my very favourite in the UK. Uh, really good modern planting and an amazing nursery. Uh, Crystal Lake and it flowers all summer. Well, the Calictrons, I know this isn't really that new, but it, well, it's a few years. Splendid is great, very tall, sterile, long flowering. Needs to be staked is the only thing. I'm not great at staking. I don't think about it too much. Um, I like to let plants hold each other up. But this is super, uh, really good plant. So, um, just some of the other other collections. I'll show you two of my favourites. 
And these were collected by Dan Hinckley in Yunnan in 1996, this one. Um, I grew from seed. It's got those lovely little pixie heads on it. It's about four foot high. Uh, beautiful, beautiful thing. And again, it's one of those plants I love that morning light or evening light coming through. Uh, Calictrum seed is sown fresh, part of the Ranunciaceae family. Uh, so you sow it in the, in the autumn. Um, this is my favourite collection, decorum. Look at those beautiful flowers, and it's covered in loads and loads of flowers. See it there? And again, those pixie heads on it. It's about four foot high, five foot high. Um, and there was loads of lovely seed on it before I left, so hopefully nobody swiped it on me. Um, so try and keep an eye out for that. Uh, does that even grow in here? Uh, this is my own seedling I found in the garden a few weeks ago. Um, don't know where it came, it just popped up in the middle of Persicaria. Um, and it's an amazing colour. So I'd love to get a name on that at some stage. And um, yeah, I'm not great at doing things like that. I always plan to do things like that and then <laughs> never happens. But it's a good one. Sorry, uh, things. And uh, Linaria peachy. So I really like Linaria. It's good for bees as well. Linaria peachy I would have got from Cotswold Garden Flowers, Bob Brown. Another great nursery in the UK. Um, it goes up to about six, seven foot high, really see-through. And those lovely peachy apricot flowers. And I, this year I grew it with Verbena MacDougall-Eye Lavender Spires coming through it. Really nice combination of tall, see-through, can be at the front of a border rather than putting it at the back. You can actually see the flowers. Another Linaria I grow, uh, Linaria vulgaris polaria. And again, I imagine these will do with you. I know further up the coast when I was talking, these, were, these weren't hardy enough, but I think they'd be fine with you. Uh, this, I always think, should be nearly underwater. It looks these very strange kind of flowers with, like, lipstick in it. Uh, it's a bit of fun. It does spread a little bit, and I have it on a kind of a wall, I have it on a wall area, kind of a raised area, and it just softly spreads around. I don't know. Softly spreading in Ireland might be horrendously invasive here. <laughs> don't get that. And there's another Linaria. Trying not the four, I never know how to say that. And again, it's about three foot high. Just spreads a little bit, and it nearly loses it sometimes. Um, but again, like full sun and well drained, and the bees like it as well. So I'm always trying to get plants that the bees like. Uh, Sangasorbus. So I said earlier on that I really got into Sangasorbus. So I collected up a whole lot of them, 15, 20 of them. Um, this isn't a new Sangasorba, I just put it in because it's, it's really the first of the Sangasorbas to flower. It flowers uh, kind of uh, late May, June time. So it kind of fills that gap in flowering from spring into summer, which is always a bit of a problem. Uh, it's a great Sangasorba, it stays upright. I think that with Sangasorbas, you just want to watch they don't get too dry. Um, and keep the soil ri fairly rich. This here is one of my favourites, Martin's Mulberry. Martin's Mulberry is, is, is about, with me it's about four foot high. I've read it gets much, it can get taller. Um, and it's got these fat flowers like mulberries. Uh, I don't have to stake it. It's a, I think it's a real winner. And it's one of those, I like Sangasorbus that they don't have too many leaves. A lot of the older Sangasorbus, like Obtusa and oh, other ones, they, 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 they have an awful lot of leaves and they spread a lot. Whereas these, the leaves are down low and they have nice sturdy stems. They don't need staking. You can see that, that's a real one now for the light coming through. And uh, Sangasorba, I like squirrel. This I saw in Dove Cottage Gardens and they had it kind of grown over a wall. Um, now, I'd be, I'd be wondering whether that would just be floppy in the garden. Is that why they had it grown over a wall? 
Um, so I've, I've, I'm trying it in the garden to see what it looks like. A um, little bit suspicious. But it has very long, pink, fluffy flowers that are really nice. Um, and if you deadhead it, because a lot of those kind of fluffy flowers, they don't die well a lot of the time. But certainly in Ireland, with a lot of rain, they can get a bit scruffy. We like plants that die well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this one dies well. This is Sangasorba blackthorn. And this was the one for me that won the, my trial of them. And I was able to repeat this one through the bed. Its leaves were low, it stays upright, it's very tall, it's about six, seven foot high. Um, flowers late in the sea, you know, it flowers kind of August, September. Um, uh, really nice plant. And great seed heads on it as well. Propagated by division. <coughs> I propagate them in spring by division. And there's a model of kind of seed heads and such and so uh, This one, uh, got this one last year, Stand Up Comedian. Stand Up Comedian has shiny green leaves and red, quite reddish stems. And it's, it's a much more improved version of tenure folium. So that, that, that's a lovely one. Again, it's tall, it'd be up six, seven foot as well. <coughs> and then the latest flower in Sangasorbus, um, this one is Kanchan Cranberry. Um, so this really brings me into winter. I don't mind if plants are a little bit floppy at that stage. They're all, everything's getting a bit floppy. Uh, the other ones, if you want us to look at for, for really late colour Sangasorbus, there's one called September Spire. Uh, and then if you want to get the tallest one, we're never happy, are we? Um, <laughs> the tallest one and really late flowering. I saw this in Merchant's Hardy Plants the other day, and he found it in a garden only two years ago or something. And it's called Needleworth Wand. Needleworth Wand. So if you're into really tall plants, I think that one, that's, that's a new plant. Um, it was too late to put it into this talk. So, Needleworth Wand, and it's white, and it's about eight to 10 foot tall. Of course I brought it back on the plane. Um, um, about 10 year, 12 years ago, I went to China collecting plants uh, with the Botanic Gardens. That's when they used to, they allowed, um, bad people like us outsiders uh, to go with them. And um, one of the plants I brought back was Lysimachia baristachis. And <coughs> part of my one had red stems and much longer flowers, really long flowers. Now it does spread, it's invasive for us, it's invasive for children. But if you have it somewhere that you can keep it in. Uh, I gave it to a nursery man in the UK and I didn't realize he was just going to put the name Huntingbrook on it, it's not official. But it's, it's in the market now, it's Hunting Brook. And, uh, and I saw it somewhere else the other day called Jimmy Blake. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good cut flower, but again, what doesn't like to, to be dry? So you'd have to have it in a damp area of your garden. I like them. We brought back a lot of plants that time. Um, I'll show you some a new Aurelia that we brought back as well in a few minutes. <coughs> Quite a lot of my plant hunting now is done. It's, it's not as adventurous as done on the internet. <laughs> plant explorer on the internet. Um, yeah, so this is the Aurelia. This one here called Aurelia echinocollis. And it certainly doesn't spread as much as Elata or Spinosa. It, I, it's actually spread very, very little. I thought I was going to have plants to sell. <laughs> I hardly have any. Uh, so this was the first place it was grown outside that part, area in China. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm using it to create another layer of interest <coughs> the, over the sunny beds. So maybe this is something you can think about. How, you know, you have maybe a flat garden, flat border. How do I create that other layer of interest over it, but still get the sun through these plants during the summer? And Aurelias have, these Aurelias have such a um, <coughs> sparse canopy that the sun still comes through them. So maybe think about that. And it's just created a whole different feel to this area, and it's given it kind of a, an exotic feel, and uh, I, I love them. I love them. It's kind of a signature plant now at home. That's the flower at the corner. 
It's in flower every day to hear. It's a sculpture that's nearly the size of the house. Um, and you can see the Aurelius there. They look quacky. I like quacky plants. Putting together a talk on quacky plants, actually, at the moment. Um, uh, so I do a lot of bulbs. I concentrate the tulips in, in one area, this whole area here. Um, uh, it's, and you can see the Chinooklawa grass is repeated through. Okay? I need the garden looking well from, I need it starting to flower from February right through until November. Um, I run a, a course called the Plants Persons course and the students are there once a month with me. And a lot of people in the business do the course and uh, gardeners. Um, so I need it looking good from when they start in February right through to, to winter. And um, so I do a lot of um, extending the seasons with bulbs. I'm just putting these in, these are not new plants or anything, but they look well together. Uh, Estrantia boan, this is a beautiful sterile Estrantia. For us, it's the longest flowering plant in the garden. It will flower from April through until November. Now, I just cut back the flowering stems when they fade. I don't cut back the leaves, because they stay, stay fairly green with us, but you could cut back the leaves and try and get it flowering again. Um, Strontias don't like to be too dry either. You know anything. And there it is with steep elegantism. It looks look really lovely. I just realized that that plant is sterile there a while ago. And somebody, one of my students said, well, why were you selling the seed? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> in trouble. Um, didn't realize it was sterile when I was selling the seed. <coughs> nice one. James, there's loads of like, good, really good James being produced. I can remember the nursery here in, in the States. Um, but Toddy Tangerine is really long flowering. In that major, that big bed there where I do all the tulips and that, the perennials that flower after the tulips are just, or they're just starting the tulips are finishing, are the Estrantes and genes. And I have loads of different genes through that bed. Um, I don't know, maybe there's 20 different genes. And it's just that blaze of kind of reds and oranges and reds and oranges really. And I, Toti Tangerine is one, it flowers from April through to winter with us. Uh, it's the longest flowering one. I think it's sterile as well. It's, uh, and it's a beautiful, Simple flower. Genes are so easy for division as well, so, so it's easy to multiply them. And I've, I've been doing quite a bit of summer division as well of, of plants. Certainly, I find great success with summer division of geraniums, strontias, genes. Uh, really quick, you get, you get plants uh, to plant out or to, to sell. Uh, lupin. Um, can you do lupins down here? No. Oh, too hot. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, Lupinus masterpiece is a most beautiful lupin. Look at that colour. It's just gorgeous colour. Um, they can be a bit dodgy with us. The slugs, Irish slugs are quite big. They're like seals. Um, and they, they like to eat these in the spring. This, this is a West County uh, nursery in England. They, they produce this one. Uh, lobelias. I grow a lot of lobelias for that late colour. Tanya. Tanya is, is super and it bulked up really quickly. I'm really trying to get that cerise bright pink colour into the garden and mix orange with it and mix whatever that would flash well with it. I want to mix with it. Whatever doesn't go with it, I, I want to go with it. Um, again, they don't like to be too dry, I suppose that's the thing. Um, Super plant divide in March. I do these. Right, it's just <laughs> so anything else about lobelia tanya? The other lobelia I use is Hadspin purple, and that is that turns into a huge big plant, um, great plant. And for the first few years, I used to actually bring them in. Uh, bring them in in the summer into the tunnel, or into the summer, in the winter into the tunnel, and then plant them back out in, uh, in, in May. 
And that was nearly to stop slugs as the main thing. But uh, they just turned into really good big plants rather than leaving them out for the winter. Let me try it, Jimmy. Okay. Lobelia, uh, this popped up. I, I had loads of Lobelia tanya, and this appeared in the middle of it. And it's got that lovely salmony color to it. Salmony, peachy color. Very unusual color. I, ha I don't remember buying it. <laughs> Maybe I did. I lose limbs. But uh, fan like, and it's a series of fan Lobelias. Uh, it's just it's a really, nice, really, really nice color. Um, <coughs> so anything else I can tell you about Lobelia? Tell you about Angelica edges. Angelicas, I have to be very wary of Angelicas. They do spread, and they spread here. Uh, this one, I just love this one because it has those purple stems on it. And uh, it's uh, very tall, as you can see. Um, um, so that's 10 to 12 foot high. Um, the thing is, collect the seed before they spread. And you need to sow the seed fresh. That's the, that's the trick with any of the umbellifers, any of the cow parsley type plants. Sow it fresh. like that that you can actually um, you can actually weave through the borders they're see-through but they're creating that other layer of interest over them. so I was thinking maybe this year what if I grew a hundred of them and grew them through the border and they're nearly imitating the, the Aurelians but they're, they're giving that extra layer of interest again uh -huh. uh, still be if I was to choose my top five the talk I gave the other day, they said I'd probably put 40 plants in the top five. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> still be Chinensis, purple lands. This is super. Um, it's, it's beautiful for a long time. It's got those buds, really good buds, that, that take quite a while to open. Um, and there it is, mixed with other spires. I can't have enough of these spires. I love spires with grasses, all flowing through each other, creating that madness. Um, there's an escapee, uh, a yellow, a yellow day. <laughs> Why do the dahlias always get mixed up? They always get mixed up, no matter what I do. And this year, nobody else was to blame only me. And they're, they're, that, that is the color of that astilbe. And I wouldn't be a huge fan of small astilbe, small little scutty astilbe. Um, I think far too many of those sort of plants are made too small. And, and they actually need to be a good, good height and to be nice and see-through. So that, that, that is still the, I, I weave right through the border. I start with one plant of all of these plants, and then I trial it, and then I propagate it. And that's how I can plant up five acres of garden. And Veronica comes from Erica. It's a few years old now, but I remember seeing it first, and it's got that lovely two-tone pink in the flower. And I saw another one recently on Facebook, where I see a lot these days, is Red Arrow, Red Arrow, certainly new to me, and it's a much darker version of that, really nice. So I'm on the lookout for that. And um, this isn't a sufficient name, but I put it on, I just put it on the other day for the fun. And um, when my mum was selling the main, the main house where we lived, uh, obviously we took some of the plants with us, and this was one of the Veronicastrums, uh, an amazing Veronicastrum, uh, about uh, seven, eight foot high, Huge long blue flowers and very green at the top, um, and I definitely think I certainly don't. We, we, we probably think it's, it was a seedling in the garden because she used to grow quite a few different bronchiostomes, and uh, maybe someday it'll be called Mammy Blake. The Actea. I think actually there should be another A in there in the Actea. Uh, Blickfang. I went to uh, Hessenhof Nursery in Holland a few years ago. An amazing nursery if you're going over to Holland. And uh, I, I had a short time there, and I was, oh, so stressful when I have short time as a nurse. And <laughs> um, the, 
I had decided, okay, I'll choose my favourite plant in their in their fields where they grew all the plants. And that was my favourite, that Actea, big fine, absolutely gorgeous. So the one we grow at home mostly is Actea brunette. Um, and I think this one is even more beautiful. It's got that uh, it's that got that kind of green in the in the in the in the beigey coloured flower. So it's a lovely green. And there it is grown with a few of the plants that I've talked about, the Tilictrum splendid and um, Sangasorba blackthorn. Actea Queen of Sheba. It's funny, I was sure that plant wasn't here. And when I arrived, I went to New York Botanic Gardens, and one of the first plants I saw was Actea Queen of Sheba. But that's okay. It's a... Uh, I realised that, or somebody told me after that, it was a peed out of border in New York Botanic Gardens, and that's who's introduced it. So, uh, it, it's, its flowers droop down. And, uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful plant. Um, I would say Acteas, again, would be in my top five perennials, certainly for late flowering. Uh, Cosmos pucidanifolius. Um, love Cosmos, this is a perennial Cosmos. And it survived with me for about eight years. Um, the year I tried to bring it in, it died <laughs> for the winter. And it's like, OK, you're not going to get looked after in the, inside. And it's been absolutely fine. It forms a tuber like uh, the chocolate cosmos. <coughs> and beautiful pink flower, flowers the whole summer long. Needs well, good drainage and uh, full sun. I'm just out to get some seed of another cosmos over here. Don't forget to get the seeds. There's great seeds over there. I get very excited with seed packets. Um, yeah, here we're coming back to this area. A friend of mine is just after getting a drone, so he's been taking those shots down on the garden. <laughs> it was going to be a video, but it all got too, too technical for me. Um, lots of pinks there. Um, Philopendula purpurea elegans is the low Philopendula. Um, it was amazing. But I'm actually going to take them all out now because they've spread quite a bit and they're going into the meadow. But it created this, this uh, that bed would be the size of this room, I suppose, and it created this frothiness. It was like pink candy floss through that bed. Uh, and it, it was lovely. You do have to make decisions and this is the time to be making those decisions when you go home. Are there plants you're fed up of, you're bored with? Are there plants that have been annoying you for a few years? Are there plants that are spreading too much? You need to make decisions today and get rid of things. We'll do it. Making decisions is great. And the clearer you are what you don't want, the clearer you'll be what you do want. So when you take out the things that you don't want, it's much easier to put in, to work with a design that kind of works for life, doesn't it? <laughs> and yeah, I shouldn't look at photos like this. this, this I, I love that plant so much now I'd want to keep it. Um, but anyway, too big. Aruncus, this is a beautiful one. Uh, I can never say the, the name. Did I welcome kinds or something like that? Um, and it's got, it's just got, you can really see through the plumes. Absolutely gorgeous. It flowers um, probably in June, July time. And it'll be on a very, very dry bank there. And uh, poor, poor soil actually. <coughs> but the runcus will do and dry. Um, Menardus, they were another plant that I got into. How did the Menardus do here? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> and so I bought maybe 25 different Menardus. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to find out once I didn't get mildew. I don't like mildew. And I wanted to once it flower for a long time, once it stayed upright, that looked well for a long time and didn't die. So what they like is a heavy clay soil. So if you have a sandy, dry soil, they tend to die out. Uh, Garden View Scarlet um, is, is new to me. I, uh, a few weeks ago here, I was told that it's actually not a new plant. But it's super, and it's much better than Cambridge Scarlet. Cambridge Scarlet just gets very, very mildewy. If you want to look up, there's a trial going on in Mount Cuba, up in here, uh, near Philadelphia. Didn't get to it, and they're doing a trial on Menardus. Um, and this isn't my garden, but it's a peat out of garden over in Yorkshire called um, 
Scamston Hall. And I asked the gardener there about this monarda, and they said it doesn't get mildew, forms really well, it's called scorpion. And it's lovely there, you can see the repetition of it in that garden. This is the one that is my favourite. And it's got those beautiful bracts underneath the flowers. Uh, it died well. So when the flowers fell off, it had those gorgeous bracts, and it still looked like it was actually still in flower. And that was on parade. And again, this looks quite similar there. It's, it's a more of a pink in it. It's a beautiful one as well. And again, it would have been, it would, uh, I'll say the winner, I just said the winner, uh, second winner in that, that trial. Uh, look at those bracts. And that's finished flowering. So that's on your list. If you get lost on the list, you're on to number 41. For winter walk means thunder cloud. Thunder. Irish people find it hard to say thunder. 33 thunders. Um, uh, Rebecca Triloba. Rebecca Triloba is short lived. Short lived with us anyway. I grow it as an annual. It's so beautiful. And it is available here. Prairie Glow. And poor, it's better grown in a poorer soil. I grew it in very rich soil this year. And it was. Um, it just didn't have that intensity of orange. So that's a super late perennial, or just grow it as an annual if it doesn't survive the winter here. I saw it in Sussex Prairie Gardens in, in the UK. Um, <laughs> I should have shown you a picture a few hours later, and that watering can was little green squares. <laughs> that That's Doris. That's my head gardener. Uh, just that, that's a roof there, a living roof on top of a cob oven, heat oven. And it was, uh, it, was, it was nice with lots of thyme and cordium job bottom up there. It's gone then. Cob oven rotted. A lot of things rot in Ireland. <coughs> Uh, flocks, not, I wasn't hugely into flocks, but, you know, I decided, right, let's look at them and see what would work in the garden. What's really long flowering, they all have gorgeous scent that gets, brings you back to my granny's garden. Nirvana is a really, really good one. <coughs> Persicaria and Plexicolis, orange field. This is, this is particularly good, uh, Persicaria. It was, uh, <coughs> What's the name? Chris Gilson in, in Belgium. He's producing a lot of these persicarias. And um, I have moved a lot of the bigger ones out of the garden because the leaves are too big and coarse and kind of like dock leaves. Uh, well, orange field is much lower. It flowered all summer with me. Um, it's just it's a lovely colour. It's not a great photograph, but it's kind of an orange colour. Fat Domino is this one here. This is the ordinary uh, persicaria on Plexicolis. That's fat domino, so it's much fatter red flowers, and it's it's a real winner. Um, tough plant, um, and they really take some shade as well. This here spreads fast, so grow it in a container. Uh, but it's got an amazing leaf. I love that leaf, purple fantasy, and um, yeah, I think it'll be really. It's a really good container plant. And friends of mine brought this person carry it back from Finland. And they they gave it to me and grew it and it had it always confuses people what it is. It doesn't spread, just stays in this very tight clump, but then grows into about that size each year. And it looks like a willow with red stems with these little white flowers on the end. It's a great one. When the tourists arrive, I always try to catch them out on this one. Nobody ever seems to guess what it is, because it really does look like the willow. Impossible to photograph, um, but maybe someday you might get it. I don't know if it's available anywhere, but... Oh, oh. that was put in in case somebody was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's early in the morning, you shouldn't be asleep, yeah. Uh, so, Crocosmias. Um, I was in a nursery as well that specialised in Crocosmias, and they were all out of flower. I, I just said to the guy, oh, just, just tell me. What's your, your really best crocosmias? 
I couldn't figure them out. And he said, Hellfire. Hellfire is wonderful. It's a real red. Okay? So not as much yellow. And you, you just want to avoid having too much, well, I do anyway, too much yellow in them. Um, and that's a pure red. Uh, slow enough to bulk up, but a really good plant. <coughs> Hellfire. And Iridium guatemalense. Um, you do you do Iridiums here, don't you? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. um, this is super, and it survived in during my sister's garden for the last uh, ten years. Uh, amazing leaves, kind of a greeny, bluey, metallic color, and uh, about three to four foot high flowers. Long season of interest. We grow in very dry soil as well. Very very good. Easy to grow from seed, sow the seed fresh. For some reason, the slugs like to eat, even though they're really spiky, the, the little seedling. They've always eaten them on me. Um, Fergus Garrett and Dixter, great Dixter, he did a, a, a little trial on, on, on heleniums, and this was, he said, the best out of what he grew. It's a really red uh, helenium. Really good one. And for me, the best one in Huntingbrook is Rag Topaz. And that's got that uh, yellowy, yellow and orange <coughs> colour. Uh, beautiful there. <coughs> when we went to China, we collected this plant, Eupatorium chinensis. <coughs> I think it's a much more refined Eupatorium than the big Joe Pye weeds. It's beautiful. It's very see-through. It's got very thin leaves that kind of have a silvery look of them. Um, and I really need to mind this plant. I just looked at it the other day to take the photo, and there's only one plant of it left. so needs to be propagated. I'm not sure if it's available, but put it on your list if you like it. Someday you might get it. Um, I didn't realize this plant actually grows a lot here. It was even up in the Berkshires where I was frozen, uh, up in the Berkshires. And uh, Nipponanthemum, I just put it in because it's the last flower to, fl to flower for us. It flowers in November, and it just gives you that clean white color in November. But you've got all those amazing chrysanthemums. Uh, God, I saw some beautiful ones while I was here. We don't grow them. I would be now. Nipponathum, I, I was reading up about it. It's kind of naturalized on the New Jersey coast there as well. Um, I, I've seen it in a good few places since I came over. Rogersia is like really into foliage plants and grow maybe 20 different or more Rogersias. And this for me is the best, Percher Bronze. This came from Helen Dillon's. Uh, family place in Scotland. Uh, amazing, and it goes really red, the leaves, really tough. And June, my sister has it there growing, and it's quite dry where she has it growing. Um, so, Mizias, I don't know if they do, do here for you, but it's worth giving them a go. Uh, I'm not sure how they manage the heat, but if you ever get a chance to get this one, this is pure silver. And this occurred in an Irish garden. Um, it was quite green, silvery green version, and then they found a seedling that was pure silver called uh, David Shackleton. New Zealand plant, high up in New Zealand, uh, needs wet, really good drainage, but not too dry. Oh, <laughs> I read that. What are those leaves like? Are they fleshy or? No, they're not fleshy. They're kind of rough uh, and ridges in them. Um, I divide them then in the middle of the winter, and luckily I'm really getting them to bulk up and get a kind of a rib, river of them growing, because it is it's very rare. Just a few woodland plants. Uh, this is down in the valley. I'm lucky to have a steep valley, and this is the next project uh, that I'm going to be working on the minute I get back. Back on Thursday morning. I'll be working on it on Thursday. And I'm really inspired about it since I came over here. I'm going to create a big Woodland garden down here, but then there's one side of the whole valley that the trees, a lot of the trees are at the end of their lives, a lot of the larch are at the end of their lives, um, and starting to fall, and uh, sycamore have seeded in, and so I'm going to create a valley garden through the whole thing. And then the other side of the valley is beautiful big oaks and beeches, and we're going to leave that the way it is. Um, um, so for a year, I'm really into tenderish stuff as well. I grow a lot of chef liras. Uh, a lot of really good foliage plants. I've been bringing them in and out for years, and I'm gonna, they're all going out next summer, and they can do what they want to do in the valley. But I want to create that kind of exotic look through the valley with these foliage plants. 
has to be low maintenance as well for me because I garden the garden mostly on my own. I had a student in the summer, but generally I'm on my own. <coughs> this is the, the brook. Looking down on the woodland garden. And just at the end of the talk, I'm just going to show you a few of the historical sites in the garden. This uh, woodland garden is in the middle of a ring fort. Uh, ring fort is a circular area, enclosed area, where for here it was the bronze, late Bronze Age people lived. So they had their home there, and they brought their animals in. So it's really special to be able to garden in, in, in their homes uh, and, and celebrate them again, rather than closing them off, like a lot of these sites are closed off. I have a garden in the middle of it, and it's great to be able to tell people about, about what it was. Anyway. Um, so this is in the middle of the ring fort. A few of the plants now in the, in the ring fort. Um, we're down to 56 there on, the, on your list. And Trollius, the cultivar new moon. Oh, it's so beautiful. Early flowering, it's that kind of going in from spring into summer. It's an improved alabaster, I suppose. Alabaster was lovely, but I love this. And it's got that kind of ivory colored flowers with a slight little paint, paint mark on the back of, of kind of a red on the back of them. Really nice. Look at that. No red in that one. Um, Oh, it's kind of a pink blush, that's what you call it. Um, a, a plant I got from Krug Nurseries, uh, Rhodiola fastigiata. It has got lovely red stems. Um, really low plant, so if you want something very small. Uh, this is grown in a kind of semi-shade. Really good. See the red stems on it there, kind of greeny yellow flowers. Prisoner uh, June Blake. June, my sister, has a nursery and garden uh, on the farm as well. She's in the farmyard. And uh, she found this in her nursery a few years ago. Uh, and it's an incredibly long flower uh, with us. And it's, uh, there's an Irish, there's a whole range of Irish primulas. Um, uh, and they're for sale every, uh, all over the place. And this would probably be in that a group of primulas for sale, so you have to get it, and you know where it came from. And uh, this she found in our mother's garden, uh, Blake Silver, which is a pure silver pulmonaria, really good, beautiful pinky blue flowers. And uh, with the pulmonarias, we cut them all back. So when they finish flowering, we cut them back, like a lot of plants, to keep the freshness, to keep them looking good, because they just get tatty. By mid June, they get tatty, so we cut them back. Uh, I use a lot of pulmonaries through the garden for early foliage. So they're great with like tulip time. Tulips coming through them. Um, this one is not in my garden, but I want it. And <laughs> I put it in because I thought maybe I'd find somebody along this trip that would have it. Anyone have it? Uh, now I give up. Uh, two and a half weeks, I still haven't found it. And it, it's got amazing kind of variegation, but much nicer. Like, it's, it's kind of a silvery, greeny, whitey, bluey color. And very, very nice. And I'm on the hunt for it. And I had other Eritronians, but I just, I come into America, I didn't really didn't know what Eritronians to grow. I just said I'd put in my favorite, the one that bulks up really well. Uh, and it's so elegant with those long, long flowers. It's Harvington Snow And uh, It's just gorgeous. And loads of flowers on it. Every year I mean to divide it, and I always forget. <laughs> uh, in Patty and Zomiana, I have seen them. Now they're quite inv they're invasive with us, so we just have to, we have to watch those ones. But usually they have more of a variegation of a yellow and green in it. But this one is a new one with pink in it, and it's really nice. So I'd be putting that in, but just keeping an eye on it; it doesn't spread too much. Uh, it flowers really late. And I have seen them in, I saw them up in Washington the other day, not the pink one then, but, but yellow. Nice flowers, very late. Uh, epimediums, I just went mad collecting epimediums there for a few years, and I have a hillside in the, in the valley, and I'm growing the epimediums through moss, through really thick moss, and they're beautiful coming out of moss. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole selection, a collection of polygon atoms, and Podophyllums and all that, growing out of moss. And um, this one here with this big long brute of a name, which I'm not going to bother saying. Um, 
it's just, again, it's got beautiful spidery flowers, really long flowering, and it's got that mottled leaf. Um, I've got some really interesting plants from a nurseryman in France called uh, T. I can never say his name. Thierry Delabro. Delabro. I'm sure, that's said a different way. And um, spine tingler, great <laughs> spray of yellow flowers, beautiful leaf. Look at that leaf. I know there's some an improved version of that. Cause somebody told me about the other day as well. Um, but it's just a gorgeous. Podophyllum big leaf. I can never find any information on this. Bought it from that Thierry de la Bro in France. Um, big leaf. It's enormously <coughs> yellow or green leaf. Uh, flowers underneath the leaf. Super plant. Um, I don't know if it's the right name or not, but that's what I bought it as. Um, and you can see it growing in the moss there. Um, my favourite. Did I use that word? <laughs> uh, my favourite of the woodland plants in Huntington is the cyan uh, podophyllum. Podophyllums have put they put the cyan on the end of it for some reason. And um, Hexandra majus. And this just erupts out of the soil in spring. Looks like an animal maybe. And its pink flowers sit on top of the flowers. Absolutely stunning. And it looks like a toad, doesn't it? Those, those leaves. There's the pink flowers. And then it, oh no, don't have the next floor. Uh, it goes up to about three and a half foot, four foot high, so it's very high. So that one with mages on the end is what you want to get. And um, I just, I love the pink flowers. They're short flowering, but good foliage plant then in the summer. Cory, what did you say? We said Cory Dab. <laughs> Corridulus <laughs> spinners is, uh, it's just a good, good one. I know these blue ones probably die down or die in the summer on you, do they? Do they, do they ever survive, the blue ones? No. Okay, I'm going to tell you about <laughs> Spinners, it, for us, is just a real good, hardy one. Good, long flowering one. And um, what they don't like is to be too dry in summer. Okay. And this is a new one I got from a nurseryman in uh, Sweden, Peter Korn. Peter Korn has an amazing art. Worth looking him up. Korn. Oh, he's been here? Wow. Never heard him speak. Um, and he was at the Great Dixter Plant Fair, which is heaven on earth, the Great Dixter Plant Fair. It was a few weeks ago, and it's an invasion of gardeners come to it. And it's loads of different nurseries. And I bought this from King Peter Corn there. <coughs> and then that's another one of his really purple ones, gorgeous flower as well. Uh, Polygonatum silver striped. Um, I'm really getting into these, and hopefully I get another few this afternoon. Plant the lights. Uh, silver striped. It's just got that elegant the way they hang down, and it keeps that silver marking through the summer as well with me. A uh, beautiful plant. I came from Merchant's Hardy Plants. Just two ferns, and then we're just that to be the end of the plants. I'm just going to show you a few things in the in the place. Uh, very hard for me to pick out ferns. It's, it's hard to know which ferns do do for you. But this is a stunning fern. Really delicate looking. Uh, has been totally hardy with me. Grown in the in the woodland. Um, it's a crow collection. The SW is a crow. Crook Nursery Collection. Uh, worth checking that one out. It's it's a little bit like that one that you grow a lot of here. The, is it upside down or back to front fern? What do you call it? Up to, upside down. It's, I think it's much nicer than that. It's just a much more delicate look to it. Um, really, really, really nice. And then, last plant. And um, this is from Chile. I'm not sure how Chile plants do, but Lophosauria quadripinata. Is that enormous fern that at the moment now it's gone up to the height of me? <laughs> Silver underneath. <coughs> and the new growth is just beautiful. And I've given up on all of the tree fern well not they give up on me, they died. Uh, the tree ferns <laughs> from Australia. In a way it was nearly 
Ireland went mad when in the boom time, and everyone would find those tree ferns coming from Australia. And it was nearly cruel, I think, that these these were taken out of the wild. Yeah. And, and they died. They all died. I used them for edging in the woodland garden now. But this is totally hardy with me. And um, they say in Chile, like it gets up to enormous. Uh, but it's the silver underneath that's just so beautiful. Lophosuria quadripinata. So that might be worth checking out from your fern growth. <coughs> <laughs> you read that? <laughs> I thought that was good. I saw that. Uh, Joe would give out to me now, and this, of course, this has been taken. Joe would give out to me for putting this into the talk. Uh, this was me as a baby, and this is the other gardener in the family. Um, and this is me and my first wheelbarrow, <laughs> and first cowboy suit, first of many. <laughs> And these are the tree gardeners. I should say tree gardeners in the family. Uh, this is June, my sister, and my mum. And of course, Doris. Uh, this is my mum. And I definitely wouldn't be standing here today if she hadn't encouraged it in such an amazing way when I was a small kid. We always had little projects going. I had a tunnel at a glass house. And um, as far back as four, I can remember, my bedroom was full of cacti. And it's funny, now I'm collecting cacti again. Just started last year. Circle. So this is in June's garden. So if you're ever over, June's garden is just literally around the corner from mine. And it's, June works with a formal design. She was a jeweler, uh, then she was a farmer, and now she's a gardener. And she's an amazing <coughs> garden designer. And um, this is her garden. So she works with the lines from her house. She's a beautiful house, it's the, it's the farmhouse. And uh, that's an upside down <coughs> elm tree, a dead elm tree. <coughs> that she turned upside down with a huge machine and stuck it into the ground. <coughs> um, so she's got an amazing collection, but she just puts plants together so amazingly. And this is where I grew up. The house, the main house was burnt down in 1922. Uh, my family didn't live there then. They bought it as a shell. Now, when I was a kid, this, we lived in here in the stable block, and when I was a kid, there was huge big trees growing in this house. It was like huge big beech and sycamore trees growing out of it. So my father spent his life collecting the furniture for the inside of the house and he built the inside of the house around the furniture. So I spent my childhood going to auctions. Um, and then this, he, we moved into it when I was about 12. So this is the sort of garden we had. It was a lot of rhododendrons, a lot of trees, and um, then loads of herbaceous as well. Just to give you an idea where, where I go from, and I'm, I'm getting back into rhododendrons now, I have a fairly strict rule on rhododendrons that look well when they're not in flower, so that you have good leaves. So I grow a lot of the big leaf ones. <laughs> um, this is out in the, the meadow. Am I going to weigh over time? Am I okay for another five minutes? Yeah. 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 Um, the <laughs> I'll tell you what she's up to. Um, this is the meadow, so there's about four acres the other side of the valley. That I've just mown a path, I mow the path every few weeks through it. And luckily, it's lo there's lovely grasses, it's not too, not too thick. And what I'm doing is, I'm using a native flower called yellow rattle. And yellow rattle seed, I shake it on the richest areas in the meadow. Yellow rattle acts as, it's semi-parasitic, so it, and it's semi-parasitic on grasses. So basically it weakens the grasses, and then the wildflowers can get in, and I can plant in. So it's a real way, rather, I would not like to be dig, dig up that soil, because, you know, that'll return to the field someday. And it is a field, but it, it, it allows me then to keep adding in wildflowers and perennials through this. And this is very low maintenance. The farmer cuts, cuts it in uh, September. I'm running out of farmers, though, because they don't, they're getting less grass each year, so. Anyway, Doris is standing at the Standing Stone. This is part of the complex of ring forts in the place. Standing stones were, they're really not terribly sure, but they were probably used for ceremonial, uh, they are meeting areas for the community of, of uh, Bronze Age people. Um, and she's definitely seen something that I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to see and have a chat with, but she stood there for ages staring at the stone. And, uh, but it's lovely to be able to celebrate these and bring people. Now, now I'm bringing tours back out and they're standing around these. Just 
probably like the people that lived there stood around them and talked around them. And uh, so that's really good. And um, this is the table down in the middle of the valley. Um, I do a lot of bartering. That's how I run a lot of the things in the garden. Uh, a friend of mine makes uh, furniture for me. I give him a few trees and he makes furniture. And he made this big long table in the woods. And at the moment he's making huge chairs for the backs or for, for the ends. And um, this is interesting. This is this is the other side of the valley, and coming into the meadow. This is the path mown through. Okay, and that's the standing stone there. Now I got this photograph a, a few weeks ago from my friend that had the drone, and he was very excited. He must have been up very early because I got it at five o'clock in the morning. A text. <laughs> he was he was really emotional, and he's. Do you see what we see? Yeah. Yeah. Circle. It was another ring fort. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get goosebumps. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing. I never knew the ring fort was there, even though I was walking here with my lawnmower, mowing the path. But from the air, you were actually able to see the circle. So at some stage, we were told there were three ring forts in in this field, and we found the other ones uh, a few days after this with the drone. Mm -hmm. They're so always walking around the field looking for them and thinking, oh, that boat must be part. And look, it's a completely different spot. And that's my boundary, just cutting it in half. So I'll have to try and get the other field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the, I, was, I, do, I used to do a bit of running and uh, going by this early in the morning with the sunrise on it. And luckily, have the iPhone in the back pocket. They take a photo of the sun going through the standing stone. <laughs> I was looking for an amazing plant to finish on, but uh, I thought that was better. <laughs> if you're ever over, there's no problem coming to visit. You can look up the website, huntingbrook.com. We have a good Facebook page, Huntingbrook Gardens Facebook page. Join that there if you want. I'm always putting stuff up. Um, if you're coming over and you're seeing that it's not open at a time when you're coming to visit, just send me an email. There's no problem coming to visit. The, we're there most of the time. We just need to get an email just to check whether gates are open and that when you come to visit. So, hope we see you someday. All right. We have time for a couple of questions. Give an idea of your season. When do you generally have your last cross in the spring and your first cross in the fall? Um, the problem is because we're so high up, we can get frost till the end of May. So you don't always get it, but you can really get caught out. And like the Daphne Five, a lot of Daphne Fives, and they, the, the, the new foliage was all burnt on them this year. We can't really put the dahlias out till the first week in June. Um, that's first, or that's yeah, the frost. Then we would have had frost in the last two weeks. It's a shorter season. Oh, the lovely spring. How do you maintain all of these birds? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I plant very close. With the herbaceous plants, I plant close. Um, I weed. Um, and I try to manage it. The other areas down the woods, incredibly low maintenance. I don't get time to do much down there. I'm trying to make time to go down and enjoy the woods. Uh, but I'm not creating big, huge areas of herbaceous down there. The herbaceous area that I've created is grown through moss, and I'm not having any problems with weeds. There's a lot to do, but I love it. What is your nighttime temperatures? Well, the coldest, uh, usually, I'm, I'm talking Celsius, so you have to convert it. Um, you know, minus five in the winter, minus, up to minus eight. Celsius. Anyone know what that is? What's that? Oh, summer. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, summer, I mean, we rarely talk about having bammy evenings where we sit out for dinner. We, it, it's cool in the evenings in summertime. Yeah. The problem is, we, I find it very hard to grow the tropical plants but to get the size in. Is that OK? What else did you want me to? <laughs> okay, any other questions? If 
Uh, maybe you can catch Jimmy later. Thanks again, Jimmy. Okay.